Okay, so the Golden Globes were in the doghouse for a few years. They had scandal after scandal, and enough was enough. They had to earn their way back. And last night, they showed their work. New voter base, new look, new vibe. Today on the podcast, did the Golden Globes finally rescue the show's reputation? I'm Alameen Abdul Mahmoud. This is Commotion. Okay, so the Golden Globes were last night, and there's a lot to talk about there. But first, real quick, let me just remind you why the Golden Globes were messy for a while. Okay, so for a long time, the winners of the Golden Globes were chosen by an, an association called the Hollywood Foreign Press Association. They're kind of like somewhat of a shadowy organization. We didn't know a lot about them, but we knew that there were payola scandals. There were questions about how the organization chose its members. Uh, just a couple of years ago, the voting group didn't include a single black voting member. Well, that association is gone now. It's been dissolved after years of controversy. Last night's show is the first under new management, under new direction by Dick Clark Productions. You got a new, restructured, more diverse voter base. So did it work? Have the Golden Globes actually changed for the better? We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about some of the big wins. Terry Hart stayed up late last night. She was tweeting, watching the ceremony. Terry, good morning. Welcome to the show. Hello, Elamine. I'm happy that you're here. I want to talk about so many of the highs and lows, but first we got to start with your highlight of the night, and this is what it was. Okay, next so quick. Netane ko pita ki mahto to six kets tapi. Netsukak, netsukakum. I um, I just spoke a bit of Blackfeet language, the beautiful community nation that raised me. I'm so grateful that I can speak even a little bit of my language, which I'm not fluent in up here, because in this business, um, native actors used to speak their lines in English, and then the sound mixers would run them backwards to accomplish native languages on camera. That was Lily Gladstone. She's accepting the award for Best Actress in a Drama at the Golden Globes. For her performance in Killers of the Flower Moon, she became the first indigenous woman to win in that category. Terry, let's talk about it. What did what? Why did that speech stand out for you? I mean, she did the thing, right? She did the thing. She wins the award. She takes the opportunity for it to be emotional, mm. for it to be political, to say something, to recognize the milestone um, that it is extraordinarily the first Indigenous woman to win this, unbelievably. And I mean, I actually think she also confronted some of the controversy around Killers of the Flower Moon in her speech when she talked about, you know, movies being made um, by allies. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I think that that was a really important thing that she added to that speech. I thought it was really touching when she said, this is for every little res kid out there who has a dream. Mm -hmm. I thought that every single, she took the opportunity. I mean, there were speeches last night. I think the first three speeches, everybody got up and read off a piece of paper, not even like the scribbled note from your hotel room paper pad that like I get, you might be a little nervous. I get yeah. what you might be saying. But I mean, you've got one of six chances. You're an actor. Can't you remember something? <laughs> um, and everybody else's speech, I mean, mostly everybody. AO had a pretty great speech as well. Um, AO Dibri winning for AO Dibri winning for the bear, yes. For the bear, yeah. yeah. Um, Kieran Culkin made people laugh saying he had just burped. And, you know, I shouldn't have said that. But, I mean, these are opportunities. It was shockingly apolitical the entire evening. There are two wars happening right now. Mm. And there wasn't one mention of anything. And I thought Lily Gladstone's speech actually had something to say and left me with some feels, unlike the rest of the entire show. Uh, I'm I'm glad we started with a highlight because now we're going to pivot to a low light, um, which was, I think, the low light for a lot of people. It's really tough to talk about last night's Golden Globes without talking about the host of the show. That's comedian Joe Coy, who, let's just say, uh, had a bit of a tough night. Let's listen. The key moment in Barbie is when she goes from perfect beauty to bad breath, cellulite, and flat feet. Ah, or what casting directors call character actor. <laughs> Uh. Some I wrote, some other people wrote. Robert De Niro's here. <laughs> Yo, I got the gig 10 days ago. You want a perfect monologue? Yo, shut up. You got, you're kidding me, right? 
slow down. I wrote some of these, and they're the ones you're laughing at. Terry, oh, I know. Oh, I Even oh. now, listening to it, I am cringing. I want to be outside my body. What, what happened there? What happened to Joe Coy? Uh, it went terribly, terribly wrong from the get-go. I mean, he steps on stage, and at first he starts kind of fawning, right, over the audience and, and being all like a fanboy. And he starts with Kevin Costner, like it's like 1997. <laughs> I mean, you've got people in, you have the most famous of famous people of 2023, and you start with Kevin Costner? I mean, I just, I that was the first thing that I was like, what is happening here? And then he turned and he started thinking that he was going to roast them, kind of a la Ricky Gervais that people sure. are kind of used to around the Golden Globes. But he doesn't have it. He wasn't capable. And you heard him there apologizing when the jokes fell flat. Blame Not the only, writers. Oh, my God. He Like, we just came out of a writer's strike where everybody's <laughs> like, the writers are the most important things in the world. <laughs> Cut to Joe Coy at the Golden Globes, throwing them under the bus. Like, it was just extraordinary. He made excuses after the Taylor Swift and said sorry to her. Everything about it was a misstep. And, you know, you want to feel sorry for the guy, but he handled it so poorly. I couldn't even work up any empathy for him. <laughs> No, I I completely agree. I really wanted to root for him after the first couple of like cold reactions, but he just kept digging his grave further and further. Listen, we got to talk about the fact that the most prestigious award of the night, that's Best Motion Picture Drama, went to Oppenheimer. That's not a huge shock, you know, since director Christopher Nolan and, and Killian Murphy also won earlier in the evening. What were the biggest surprises for you of the Golden Globes? Yeah, there were actually some surprises. It started with um, when Anatomy of a Fall won for Best Screenplay. I think movie. that was a yep. yeah, a French movie, a fantastic French movie. Justin Trier, mm, sorry, um, my French not so good, um, but right. she was she was spectacular, and the movie is great and well deserved. It's a really really dense kind of courtroom thriller mm. about whether or not a woman murdered her husband, and um, so that kind of set me on a tone of like, oh, what are we in for here? And then we have the surprise Robert Downey Jr. win over Ryan Gosling. Now, some people don't think that's a surprise. I thought it was a huge surprise. I thought Ryan Gosling was going, you know, Bar I was you thought alive. you thought he would win for Barbie over Robert Downey Jr. for Oppenheimer. A hundred percent. Yeah. And um, and I think, you know, they did that cute cutaway to Ryan and he was ready for that cutaway. Like it seemed like that Barbie table was like, you know, had some springs they under thought, their feet. I agree. I agree. And they had to be sat down. I, uh, I have to say, I, our, our producers, Amelia and Shuli, noticed this um, pattern of pairings winning. So like Divine Joy Randolph um, and uh, also Paul Giamatti winning for the holdovers. You know, Aya Dibri and Jeremy Allen White winning um, for the bear. Uh, Killian Murphy and Robert Downey Jr. both um, in Oppenheimer. So a lot of pairings sort of won for being in the same work together. Listen, we got about a minute left here. I mentioned off the top, the Golden Globes went through all this period of restructuring and recruited a more diverse international voting base. Was that reflected in the results, you think, last night? Uh, well, they already ruined that by not nominating the color purple. Mm. Um, so okay. that was that was automatically out the window. I mean, it was still Golden Globes pretty white, right? I mean, you know, we're talking about Oppenheimer being the big winner. We're talking about The Bear and Succession being the big winners. Those are all white actors and actors made by white people. So um, was diversity reflected in the results? No, and it wasn't reflected in the nominations either. I, I found it interesting that they had Oprah handing out the big award of the night in a you know, beautiful purple that, dress, but no, not to the color purple because she's a producer, of course, on the color purple. Yeah, I thought that it was quite magnanimous of her, actually, because I think that they had to have been quite disappointed to not get a nomination. Mm. And it was the lead kind of snub out of the Golden Globe nominations when they came out. Um, a few weeks ago. So, right. you know, to have Oprah there, I wonder if that deal was made before the nominations. Not that Oprah doesn't have the power to say thanks, but no thanks <laughs> after that. But um, I think that, you know, Oprah um, has found her inner peace at where she's at. And uh, she was fine to stand on that stage and talk about the importance of movies as she did last night. Terry Hart, award season is just beginning. We're going to be talking a whole Ooh. bunch. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Elmine. Oh, my gosh. You're the best. Derry Hart is an entertainment journalist and Commotion's resident Golden Globes expert. She was in Toronto.
That's a jam. My name is Alameen Abdul Mahmoud, and you're listening to Commotion. Some new music right there. Dua Lipa, Houdini. It's the first song from her upcoming third album. We don't have a lot of information about it yet. We don't have a title. We don't have a date. But it's already one of the most anticipated albums of 2024. So while we wait for that to drop, I wanted to bring in some pop music aficionados to talk about some of the big albums and musical trends that are on the horizon this year in pop music. Maura Johnston, Rihanna Cruz are here. Welcome back. Welcome back to Commotion. How's it going, everybody? I'm so happy that you're here. Hello. Hi. Hello. Good to be here. Hello. Hello. Listen, Maura, I'm going to start with you. We're entering the middle years of this decade, which feels improbable to say, first of all, because 2020 was five minutes ago, I swear. That's usually when a decade's musical identity starts to take shape. Like 1984, you know, you already kind of had, like, I don't know, Thriller. You 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 had big records that sort of anchored the sound of that decade. How would you spin the narrative about the music in the 2020s so far? I think we might still be in 1981 musically a little bit. I think we're still trying to figure out the identity. It's a little more unpredictable. Sure. You know, you have like Kate Bush and Miguel and Ghost kind of having old songs bubble up because of TikTok. And then you also have, you know, the U.S. charts particularly opening themselves up to more styles of music that aren't necessarily from the U.S. You have, Mm. you know, obviously the, the huge success of Bad Bunny, who's going back on tour this year. You have last year's Hot 100 breakthrough of Musica Mexicana with Peso Pluma and Esteban Armado's Ayabaya Sola. You have Tyla's Water, which operates in her style of what she calls Papiano, which blends pop with the South African dance music Amapiano. That song and you is also so have, you know, good. Oh my, it's so good. Water. And her, her, her debut is coming out later this year. Yes. And then you have, you know, this, the bigger successes of K-pop with acts like 5050, RIP and New Jeans, mm-hmm. you know, having success on Western radio. And it's really kind of, I think, just a lot more unpredictable and a lot more open to things that are completely unexpected. So I know expect the unexpected, which I guess is a theme for the decade as a whole <laughs> at this point. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, that has generally been the vibe around here. Rihanna, what about you? What's yeah. your read on the 2020s so far? I agree. I I think the 2020s have been so weird and random. And I think 2024 for me reflects 2014 a lot, Mm. where the biggest songs of 2014, you know, if you look back, right, most of them aren't that good. And then you start to see big superstars. Is that the year the cheerleader came out by Omi? Is that that (laughs) – yeah, I think it could. I like that song. It was like the, the year of like yeah. like Rude by Magic, you know what I mean? <laughs> Random like one hit wonder singles. Yes. I think 2024 will continue to like see this fracturing where it's split between like A-list mega superstars, your Taylor Swifts, right? And mm-hmm. then like your virtual no names who are using their fan bases to get chart positions. Right. Okay, so let's talk about some of the big records that we think are going to be, you know, the albums that we'll be talking about maybe a year from now. Maura, this was your pick, which fits right into this international movement that you were just talking about. Kali Ochis, the Colombian-American singer, getting a little help from Carol G. That is going to be on the new album from Kali Ochis that's going to come out this Friday called Orchideas, which is you, uh, this Friday. Uh, more or less, talk about Kali. She's one of those names that you've seen popping up everywhere, you know, in the last little while. Yeah. You know, songs um, like on songs with Daniel Caesar, Tyler, the Creator, Kate Trinata. She's built this impressive sort of genre hopping catalog thing of her own in English and Spanish. Why do you think this will be her year? I loved her record from last year, Red Moon and Venus. It was just a record that I kept returning to since it came out in March. Mm. And I feel like this record coming out, first of all, so early in the year and getting a jump on everything, um, you know, it's her second Spanish language album. It's going to have, like we heard, Carol G, Peso Pluma. And I just feel like, you know, she said in in a statement that she wants to expand what Latinas in music can be, how they can be perceived. Mm. And one thing, one strength of hers is that she has really just been so as I said earlier, unpredictable in the um, variants of genres that she's embraced while creating her own kind of aesthetic and outlook that I feel like, you know, this record, um, she said in a statement, she was like, 
I really want this record to be the timeless, eerie, mystic, striking, graceful, and sensual allure of the Orchid. And that makes it sound also like an ideal companion to Red Moon and Venus, which had a lot of those qualities. And also just fantastic songs. So I love when an artist can sort of set the highest ambition for the record and then like actually end up achieving that. Uh, Rihanna, yeah. as that song was playing, like you were vibing. You were like, yeah, I'm having the time of my life. You totally. have, a lot, have a lot of excitement um, about the Cali Ocho's record too. Do you want to talk about why, what sets her apart, you think? Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like, you know, as we've previously mentioned, right, we've kind of been seeing these Latin artists, right? These mm. Latino, Latina, Latinx artists get higher radio play right like yes. I, i'm still hearing telepathia on the radio more so than i was when it came out mm -hmm. you know so i feel like kelly Uchi's star is only continuing to grow and i saw her a few months ago at camp flogna where she performed songs from this upcoming record and i was like you know on the fence about kelly and then i saw that performance and i was like oh wow like she is something special and mm. this record I think it's going to have sounds from Mariachi. It's going to have sounds from Cumbia. Like she's incorporating, like I heard like a 90s Selena vibe track, you know, nice. like she's incorporating all these sounds on her latest record and not shying away from her Latina-ness. And I, I love that, you know? That's a, that's a beautiful way to describe it. Uh, also, let's talk about your record that you think is going to make some noise this year. Uh, Rihanna, it's the year of our Lord 2024, and you're out here with MGMT. That's MGMT That's with I Mother am. Nature. <laughs> they've got an album coming out called Loss of Life. That's out in February 23rd. Um, they've had this fascinating career because their debut record was this massive record back in 2007. It becomes one of the big sort of pop indie albums of the era. But then they've just kind of ignored trends. They've just kind of followed their own vibe. And then they've arrived at this album that's going to come in, in February. Why is it an album that stands out as something that you're looking forward to this year? First of all, I mean, I, I love MGMT. I think they always come in with the with the heaters. Um, yeah. But I, I think this moment specifically for them is really fascinating because in the sort of nostalgia cycle that we live in, we've seen a lot of what MGMT is doing pop up in random places where, mm. like, you know, they were getting placements in Saltburn, you know, and like other movies. <laughs> yes. where, like, yeah. Saltburn is set in 2007, up. to be fair, but 100%. Yes. Right. But yeah, yeah, yeah. like, you know, that's a pretty cool place. Yes, of course. I agree. They, um, they are blowing up on TikTok with songs from their last record. Yeah. So something like Little Dark Age got a lot of plays in that regard. And I think this record, similar to like a band I really love, Ween, they're like <laughs> kind of alternating between like yes. the electronic weirdness, you know, 80s pastiche vibe yeah. and this guitar based kind of dream pop that they've been doing their entire career. And I think this record is a shift back to that sound. So I, I feel like a lot of people will connect with it. Rihanna Cruz, the president of the MGMT Defense Fund. Uh, Maura yes, Johnston, or do we see, or do you see that the MGMT renaissance is upon us? You know, the first two songs that I heard in 2024 were, were actually MGMT songs. Uh, the <laughs> DJ at this dance party that I was at dropped, you know, they played Countdown into the Countdown. And then the first song after we, everybody said happy new year was electric feel <laughs> and then they went into kids so i don't know maybe yes <laughs> wow. uh, wait, that's actually kind of amazing that's an amazing way to start I the know. year my friends and i were like okay <laughs> <laughs> didn't see <laughs> this coming this but all right <laughs> yeah uh yeah. rihanna last year we had you on this podcast to talk about this trend of you know sped up songs um, on on tiktok what are you seeing now is like could be the trend that or the thing that could shape the story of music in 2024 yeah, I feel like sped up songs aren't going anywhere. You know what I mean? They're still around. Yeah. They're still happening. But I, I I do think that the charts in the upcoming years will continue to see older songs blow up in popularity where a new release won't necessarily matter as much as well as like a curated older song placement. Mm. And in 2023, we saw that a lot on the charts with these older songs coming out, you know, like five, 10 years ago, like Sure Thing by Miguel, yes. shooting up 
the charts, you know, and granted that had a sped up remix, but also it was an older song that was rediscovered and connected with people. And I, I think in 2024 and in the years to come, we'll see more of an importance placed on that where when an album cycle is over, that doesn't necessarily mean your song can't chart anymore. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mora, Mora, what's your read on that? Do you think that's going to be the big force this year? I think that'll be a force. I also am really curious because I feel like TikTok is such a medium that really lends itself to musical theater. And we have this kind of spate of musicals that's coming out with Wonka and The Color Purple. And on Friday, Mean Girls comes out. Yes. Um, so I'm wondering if there's going to be kind of a more musical theatery aspect and even you know some singer songwriters certainly um the singer songwriter m byhold who had a hit last year with the song numb little bug i feel like was a very like musical theater oriented yeah so i i, I think that that might come into play especially because renee rap who's in the mean girls musical as renina jo regina george has already had some success with her pop album snow angel so it's not too far Mm -hmm. And, her, you know, the first song from Mean Girls that she put out was with Megan the Stallion. Yes. Uh, yeah. So I should say, if folks are just joining us, this show is called Commotion. My name is Alameen Abdul Mahmoud. And we're talking about the, the, the future of music in 2024, what we can expect in 2024. Maura Johnston is here. Rihanna Cruz is here. Listen, we've been talking about the artists and sounds that we think will make a big impact in 2024. But maybe we should pick something that's a little under the radar that you're personally really excited about. Maura, this is your pick. All right, that is Mary Timoney. Is that how you say that? Is that how you say that, Maura? Yeah. The song is called yep. Dominoes from the um, upcoming album, Untamed the Tiger. Tell us about Mary Timoney. What makes this record special for you? Uh, Mary's been one of my favorite artists and one of indie rock's most like prolific, interesting songwriters for decades. Um, she was in the band Helium in the 90s. Mm. They put out these like sort of grungy, gorgeous feminist albums manifestos that really have influenced current bands like speedy ortiz and snail mail she's also in the power trio x hex who are a little more like punky and kind of like 1981 actually and then uh you know the supergroups wild flag which she's in with carrie brownstein of sleater kinney and hammered holes which she's in with al makai of fugazi so this album untamed the tiger is her first solo album in 15 years mm. and she wrote it while taking care of her ailing parents and she said that making the quote impossible decisions during that period made her creative choices more manageable and that's kind of mm. amazing to me because i always feel like her whole career has been marked by this incredibly creative spirit. So I'm really curious to see what that results in, because I feel like every left turn that she's made over the years has just been really exciting. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a beautiful way to describe that album. Rihanna, you chose this. I don't want to confuse you for fulfillment. I don't want to wonder what I love is. I might be the one to Rihanna, 30 seconds to you. What are we hearing right now and why are you so excited about it? So we are hearing What Now by Brittany Howard. And uh, if you're not familiar with Brittany Howard, she was the driving force, I would say, behind Alabama Shakes. Yeah. And this is her second solo record that's going to come out. And I'm really stoked for it. I listen to a lot of like NPR member stations in LA and I just know this yeah. is going to clean up <laughs> NPR member station set list. Um, I'm so excited. I love this track. I love her. I see her as an inspiration in a lot of ways. And I, I think this record is going to be very musically sound Yeah, and kind of, you know, soundtrack into, into the spring. That's a beautiful way to put it. I appreciate both of you guys being here. Maura Johnston, Rihanna Cruz. Thank you so much for your time. Absolutely. Thank you. Of course. Can't wait to hear more of these records later this year. Maura Johnston is a freelance music journalist in Boston. Rihanna Cruz is a host of Vulture's Switched on Pop podcast. They're based in L.A. And that is it for the podcast today. Hey, remember, you can listen to any episode of Commotion anytime you like, wherever you get your podcasts. If you have like 10 seconds, we'd really appreciate if you go to our Instagram and just follow us. We are at Commotion CBC. My name is Alameen Abdul Mahmoud. Hey, I'm going to be here tomorrow. So if you're going to be here tomorrow, I would love to talk to you then. <laughs>